Hey everyone, hi. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be talking about all of the all of the books that I've read in September. There were some high highs and some low lows. I have a lot of unpopular opinions, so buckle up. <laughs> and if you're new to my channel, then a special hello to you. I am Shelly and I really love to read. I'm slightly book obsessed and this channel is a wonderful outlet for me to gush and be um, my fullest self with the books, the book love that I have. <laughs> Um, and yeah, that's what this channel is dedicated to. So if you are about that or you're enjoying the vibe and you're not set yet subscribed, I would encourage you to do so. But otherwise, let's go ahead and get into the meat of this video. I have a handful of unpopular opinions and I've decided to go worst to best probably to torment my own self because I find it kind of difficult to talk about books that I don't really like that are so well loved because I try to keep the balance of holding space for somebody who loves the book, but also recognizing that I myself didn't love the book. And so I've already like started this video a couple of times and I'm struggling through the first book, which is at the bottom of the list. So the, <laughs> the book that I liked the least is actually a booktube darling. So many people love this book. It actually made it into the list of the top 100, the best 100 books of the 21st century, according to the New York Times' readers. It was actually quite high up on the list. And I did not like this book. I found it cheesy and a little like overwritten, a little out of touch. And I think I was actually the target audience for it. The book I'm talking about is Gabrielle Zevin's Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. And what this book is, is that it is essentially at the heart of it, a book of friendship. Um, it is following Sadie and Sam who become friends when they're really young, kind of on a lark. Um, and they meet at a hospital and bond over video games. None of these, none of this is a spoiler. And throughout the book, um, Gabrielle Zevin moves in and out of time. And so you see that there are long periods of time where Sam and Sadie are not friends for various reasons. She gets into them in the book. And then they are friends. And really more than friends, they are partners. They are working partners. They have decided to take on the video game industry and they are, you know, that's that's their career path. And it, it follows that friendship, you know, the platonic friendship of a male and female and their ups and downs. And what's interesting is that I think that I was actually the direct target audience. Like I'm a millennial, some of the more obscure games that they mentioned, like the Oregon Trail, like I've played that. Um, I, I get it. <laughs> I, you know, I like the video game industry. Um, I have a fondness for it. I don't play very many video, video games, but it is, it is definitely plucking the nostalgic heartstrings for me. Um, and yet I just, I just didn't love it. I didn't love the characters. Um, and I didn't, I really had a, I, I had a, a, an ax to grind against one character in particular. I didn't like Sadie. Um, I liked some of the outlier characters. I found some of the characters kind of atrocious and I think that was on purpose. So in that way, the book was successful. Some of the atrocious characters were supposed to be atrocious. But overall, I thought the mix of video games and this friendship, I really thought the parts about the video games weren't very good. I really think that that was it. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I just didn't like it. And I thought that at times there were certain um, plot, you know, twists that were I thought were incredibly um, convenient, but here's, oh, now it's coming back to me. It's so, like, as I'm talking about it, I'm like, oh yeah, that's why I didn't like the book. Here's what I didn't like. The book takes place in the, I think, 80s, 90s, 2000, early 2000s, and, you know, moves through time. And there are some very specific 2024 terminology, ideas, concepts, um, like identity politics that's happening very currently, 2024, 2023. And that was placed in the early 2000s. 
And it didn't feel like the early 2000s. It was like, it felt like Gabrielle Zevin was writing these characters that were like ahead of their time and, you know, very like forward thinking and, you know, and all of that. And I didn't buy it. I, I didn't buy it at all, you know? Um, and, and I, I just was like, I don't know. I thought it was kind of like, I felt like she was talking down to me. Like, oh, you know, we're not going to, you're not going to notice this like identity, politics, language moments that, you know, are very, very, very of the last two to three years that are now being placed in like the late nineties. I just didn't, it. I was like, okay, <laughs> I don't, I don't buy it at all. And then paired with like the unlikable characters or at least some unlikable characters that I just didn't want to read about and some really, really in, like um, tough conveniences for me to swallow. I just didn't like the book. And I think that that is very contrary to <laughs> most, most of the opinions out there. So, you know, sorry, not sorry kind of thing. Continuing with the unpopular opinions. I am, I, the next book I picked up because of Simon Savage. I love Simon. I love Simon's channel. I love the videos he does with his mom. This is not, this is just about a difference of opinion. And um, I picked it up because it was like Simon's favorite book of the year so far. So it is Clear by Karis Davies. Also, the premise really appealed to me. It is about, the Clear by Karis Davies is about a young, about a guy who is serving an eviction notice to a hermit or a, a recluse, I think that's a, a better word for it, who's living on this remote island. And through the book that's very quiet and atmospheric, it's, you know, it's this, like, I don't know, the, the foggy, cold, icy winds of this remote island where this man has been living by himself. And um, and you can really like feel the loneliness and isolation that this um, recluse has experienced. And then now actually having someone on the island, but for not good reasons, but those reasons are, aren't necessarily clear um, to begin with. And you're kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop and all of that was was well done, I thought. And overall, I really thought the atmosphere and the buildup was fascinating. Um, and actually, like I quite liked the the nature writing and Davies' um, beautiful descriptions of of just like building the scene and this tension between the recluse not knowing that he's going to be served an eviction notice and the um, the eviction victor. Um, you know that kind of um, the play between one another. However, there is a twist at the end or like very near the end that I was like, what? <laughs> what is happening? I was so confused. And perhaps I should go back and reread it to see if there were clues leading up to the twist that I missed. But I am like, I'm a fairly detailed reader. Like I'm a fairly, I pay attention to my reading. And I was paying attention to this reading and then the twist came and I was like, huh? And I was reading this with a friend and even for her, she was like, what? <laughs> did we miss something? And I don't think I did. It was weird and didn't work for me and like kind of ruined the book even though I could see like what a good writer Davies is and the beautiful nature descriptions that I love by the way. Overall, I was just like, what happened? So that book left me very confused and I don't think I read it wrong. I was just like kind of baffled. Um, so I know that Davies has another book. I think it's called, I think it's called West. And maybe I'll just have to try again. And maybe she just couldn't stick the landing for clear and that's what didn't work for me. But overall, like I liked her writing. I thought it was, it was good, just like, baffling ending. So there's that, there's that. I'm going to move on. All right, next up, a book that I had such high hopes for and was just so weird. Um, I read it for my 1960s video um, and I'll leave that link down below. I do a kind of deep dive into the 1960 to 1964 
I look at the New York Times bestsellers, I look at like what was being published and I really enjoyed making that video. And in that I read books from 1960 to 1964. And the first or one of them was The Prime of Miss Jean Brody by Muriel Spark. Now I like Muriel Spark as a writer. I read Aiding and Abetting and that was fantastic. She is a Scottish writer, I believe, and she writes these very slim little books. Like all of her books are under 250 pages. And I think that especially Aiding and Abetting is super sharp and super witty. Now the Prime of Miss Jean Brody is actually her most famous book. I believe it's studied in schools or has been studied in schools. And it is about an avant-garde teacher who it has, she connects with her young students. They're like preteen age, I think like 11, 12, 13, 14, kind of around that age. Um, she is, she has, she like dances to the beat of her, of her own drum. She like walks to the beat of her own drum. She doesn't really care what administration thinks of her. And she's kind of manipulative, um, to be honest with you. And then there's like a twist at the end that kind of made my jaw drop. And I was surprised by the twist. Um, apparently the um, very, very wonderful Maggie Smith, um, the actress has passed away and she actually played Jean Brody in the Prime of Miss Jean Brody, the movie, which I would love to watch. I just don't watch very much television. And I would love to see that take on the Prime of Miss Jean Brody, like how that, how they depict her. Because in this book, she's, Brody is a very odd duck and she comes off kind of manipulative. And I, I just, as I was reading, I was just kind of like, this is fine. Um, whereas I felt like Aiding and Abetting, the other book was so razor sharp that I really wanted to see that sharpness, that wit, that dark humor, all of that, and to it, for all of it to come together very seamlessly in The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, but it just didn't. Um, and because of that, it was quite the disappointment, especially since I have been meaning to read this little slim book for years, <laughs> for years. I think it's saving grace is the fact that there is so many, there are so many articles written on it and I could get a deep dive in different perspectives on this book um, from, you know, especially since the 1960s, there's been years, like decades of writings on this book and deconstructing it and thinking about it. And so I liked actually reading about this book, this book more than I read, more than I enjoyed actually consuming its pages. So take that for what you will. It was kind of a miss for me, um, but I do believe that Muriel Spark has more books out there that I will love. So those last three books were like the misses for me. Now I'm getting into like the mid territory. Like I liked the books, but they weren't perfect and um, they were enjoyable, but maybe not amazing. So I will say the first one is going to be Sweet Bean Paste, which I read for a vlog I did about 2017. I did a deep dive in to 2017. The book is um, by Durian Sukagawa and it's translated by Allison Watts. If you want some semi-spoilery thoughts, I will leave the, the 2017 vlog linked down below. But it is essentially a, um, it is about, let me get my names right. The book is about Sintaro, who is working at a doriaki shop, which is, um, it's set in Japan. It's originally written in Japanese. A doriaki shop is like a, a sweets, um, you know, it's a equivalent to like a chocolate croissant, but the Japanese version, it's um, sweet bean paste sandwiched in between two pancakes. Um, and it's like a little sweet treat. And so he's working at a doriaki shop and he is being visited by this older woman who has some critiques about the sweet bean paste and ultimately wants a job with him. And Sentaro has his own past, his own, um, his own like hangups. And this woman coming in his life um, really seems like, I don't know, like a kind of like a, a stroke of luck or um, like, a, like a godsend um, for a lack of a better term. And so she comes into this, you know, this shop and shares her expertise. And then you find out something about both Sintaro and this older woman that really changes the nature of the shop and the, um, their friendship and the way they interact with one another. I thought it was a very compassionate book. And I learned about Japan um, and the way they treat certain people 
Um, I learned more about Japan, which I quite liked, but my only thing was that this book could have been longer. It could have stand to have been a little more well-developed. It really is like a, a super short, almost novella length book. And I thought it could have just used like 50 more pages to help develop the story. Um, I like I wanted more from it and so in that way it was you know a slight miss but overall I really liked the book. We're getting to books that I actually quite liked and the first book in this section was Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey. Now she's this author is mostly known for her nonfiction book Migrations but this is her fiction work and this is about scientist N.T who is part of a project to reintroduce wolves to the Scotland the Scottish Highlands in order to help rebalance their ecosystem, essentially. Um, and in that way, that it was super interesting to learn about this reintroduction of a species to an area to help balance things out. Um, and Inti actually has a sister named Aggie who, um, who's accompanying her on this project. There's like a team of researchers and they're in this like teeny little town and for the most part, people of the town are not very welcoming to this project because of their prejudices towards wolves. And Inti is, you know, she's, you know, trying to get this whole thing to work. And then about a third of the way through, which is not a spoiler because I think it's on the back, but there's a murder that happens. And so you're like, okay, who did it? Is it the wolves or is it all these suspects? And I thought structurally, the first third of the book building up to this murder that happens and then having all of these suspects that really have intent or could have intent to this, you know, to have murdering this person that was murdered was really good. And then there's like the investigation and then everything goes Kuzmin is crazy off the wall, off the chain at the end, <laughs> like it goes wild. And so I didn't know this at the time, but this is definitely an unhinged woman book. It is one of those categorically um, like if you like Bunny by, by Mona Awad or Boy Pirates by Eliza Clark, it is in that family. It is in that vein. And I have read both of those and this is definitely it. But it's kind of disguised itself as like a normal, not unhinged woman book. And then all of a sudden it literally like flies off the rails. <laughs> like, and in that way, like I found it quite delightful. Um, I don't know if every single part of this book worked for me, but I was surprised when I read it. And it was just, I don't know, once I figured out, I was like, oh, this is, this is definitely categorically one of those just like truly unhinged woman books. I was like, yes, <laughs> he, yes. Um, so I, you know, so here was this and it, it is a very global book. It's do, like, there are we're not just in the Highlands, we're like in Australia for part of it. And I think we're in Canada for part of it. And there's like this ode to nature and there's this like connection to nature. Like Charlotte McConaughey is doing a ton in this book. And again, I'm not sure if every single thing worked for me, but overall the wild, wacky, weird, odd place that this book goes is probably like the most delightful part of it. Um, and again, it's really for fans of Bunny by Mona Awad or Boy Parts and all the other Unhinged Woman books I cannot think of right now. But if you can, if you know of Unhinged Woman books, like leave them in the comments down below. I like, overall, I like that category of book. It just, it kind of threw me off because I didn't expect it. And then it came out as an Unhinged Woman book and I was like, oh, 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 this is what it's doing. And then from there, I was like, okay, I'm re delighted at what it's doing. The next three books, I really don't have any critiques on. I just, I just have like a favorite favorite that I'm gonna leave at the end. So the next book, another translated book. Wow, I read a couple of translated books this this month. The first one was Sweet Bean Pace, and now Mar The Wall by Marlene Hosshofer, um, translated by Sean White. It was first published in Germany. Okay, I had to look it up. I always, the details of things. So I read a Japanese translated book and now a German translated book. So The Wall is about, it is really the thought experiment of what would happen to an individual who suddenly found herself behind a wall, behind like a thick wall where you could see the other side, but you cannot 
get to the other side and you're in this really remote place and you have to now survive. Um, I would imagine that it's kind of like Under the Dome, but instead, I believe, of Stephen King, Stephen King's Under the Dome, but Under the Dome by Stephen King, I believe there are like several people in a more populated area trying to figure out what would it be like to live in now a confined space and working together as a society. I think that that's what Under the Dome is about, but I have not read it. This, on the other hand, is about isolation and living on your, by yourself, learning how to farm, uh, you know, being careful of the resources one has, um, making friends with the creatures around you because there are other creatures, and ultimately, like the highs and lows of being in such solitary, in a, such a solitary state. Um, and so you have this this woman that this happens to. She's now behind this confined space, and it's about like appreciating the little things. Like in a lot of ways, it was an homage to nature and the beauty of nature and other living creatures and her appreciation for the company that animals gave her, which was so beautifully done. Um, I quite like this book. Now I'm like thinking back on it. I'm like, wow, I actually like this book more than I thought. Um, and it was just so well done. And you, I ended up really getting attached to her four-legged uh, friends. I, I was really attached to them. I was really in love with them. Um, I was really rooting for our main character and wanting her to survive. And weirdly, this book also has like a very surprising twist near the end. And I was sort of like shook. <laughs> like I was like, what happened? And it worked so well. I was not expecting it. It fell perfectly in line with the scenario that she had set up. And in some ways, I mean, I don't want to say it was disappointing, but it was, it just, it played out in a very interesting way. So if you're someone who likes nature writing, likes thought experiments, um, weirdly, I found the book I'm going to relate this to is I Who Have Never Known Men by Jacqueline Hartman. Both The Wall and I Have Never Known Men were re um, recommended by Emily Fox, the booktuber Emily Fox, um, who I'll leave linked down below. Um, and they're actually very similar. They have a similar vibe. Um, I have, Who Have Never Known Men is more about like um, living in a society by themselves, survival, that kind of thing, but more with a community of people. And the wall is truly like one is by oneself and, you know, pondering the situation and meditating on it, but also appreciating the little things and having one's moments of being ungrateful and grumpy and angry, but then also like coming back to oneself of, of gratitude and, and love for just being alive. Um, so I, it worked. I, I really liked that book. I should say that I read The Wall and this next book for my 1960s video. Uh, this next book I just finished like yesterday with my class and it is The Book of Three by Lloyd Alexander. This is a high fantasy middle grade book uh, written in like 1964, I believe 1963 or 64. And it was great. <laughs> okay. We follow Taryn who is living in this small area and all he wants is adventure, like that's all his heart seeks. And then he gets the adventure of a lifetime. Um, true hero's journey where we see him sort of young and idealistic. And then at the end, you really see him grow in character. Uh, the second book is The, ba the Black Cauldron and Disney actually made a movie on The Black Cauldron. Um, but Taryn is precious and it's that it's classic good versus evil, classic. Um, hero's journey and it is wonderful. Now I read this with a group of 11 and 12 year olds and to my surprise and actually to their surprise as well, we were both surprised that this was written so long ago because the language and the characters and um, the situations, they felt very modern. Like you could have told me this was published three weeks ago and I would have believed you. It is very much playing on um, some biblical tropes. I would say there are influences of both J.R.R. Tolkien and um, C.S. Lewis in this book. Um, there is like a Noah of Noah's Ark figure in here. Um, and, and ultimately like it was great. There's also like a, a golem type character in here. Um, just fantastic. And you know, I really enjoyed reading this with my class. I had my little voices. My class, you know, I have some kids that love reading. <laughs> it's so funny. The kids that love reading um, are actually friends with each other. And then I have some kids that are reading reluctant. And 
I, but in this book, I got a gush like about my love for the, you know, for reading. And it was, oh, I just really like this. This is great. <laughs> and um, it really hit on all those, like if you're a high fantasy fan, it hit on all those, those wonderful notes of beautiful world building and magic and um, great characters. And I just, I really like this. So I'm so glad that I read it. My favorite book, my favorite, favorite book of the month was The Heart's Invisible Furies. Wow. By John Boyne. Mm, I love this book. <laughs> this is like a Shelley book through and through. It was so good. But some people I think relate, they think that Shelley books are like slow, boring character development. <laughs> nothing that nothing happens. I think people think that that's my taste. Um, but no, this book was everything. Okay, so it is about a kid named Cyril, who is he's a, adopted into this quirky family of family of three. Now his parents are very odd. And he it's Ireland, he is born around the 1940s. And we we move through his life. And and we know from, or Cyril knows from a very young age that he is attracted to other boys and you know, as he grows to other men. And in Ireland, that is so, um, that is, it. Well, for a while it was against the law and it's so taboo and it's so um, stigmatized that it really plays into the way that Cyril relates to himself. And, um, and so I really was surprised and I talked about this in my 1917 video, or my 2017 video, because this was published in 2017. The, what I what I had mentioned about it was that I was surprised that Cyril is really the calm, the calm character, the introspective character, the the sweet character amid these larger than life other characters that surround him. So his his stepmother is just um, avant garde, a writer, a chain smoker. You know, she's sort of she's just like a true character with a capital C. Um, his father is, or his stepfather is just this odd duck of a man, again, that has his own opinions about the world and is not afraid to share them. And then his best friend, Julian, is another, like, really gung-ho, uh, larger than life. I, why can't I think? Like, he's just boisterous, friends with everybody, the center of the party, the, um, the, the one who is just in control of the, the temple temperature in the room kind of person. And so you have all these characters in the middle, you're getting this, this story from Cyril's perspective, who is sweet and has all these like, you know, complicated thoughts about himself. And I just loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Um, you know, some of the things were a little convenient. I don't really care. There was some boy talk about, you know, went talking about women and um, wanting, you know, to have certain experiences. And typically, I mean, sometimes that doesn't work for me and I'll like really not like a book for that. But in this book, it felt very intentional. It felt very purposeful and that it had, um, it had a, a driving force uh, behind it in the story about where the story was going and, um, and I just thought it had, it was full of empathy. The whole book was full of empathy. So if you were looking for a fantastic read, if you don't mind some of the things that I talked about, some of the subject matter that I talked about, it was wonderful. It was great. And I absolutely loved it. So that was my favorite book of the month. Let me know what worked for you. I'm always wondering, let me know about the unhinged women books. I would love to know good ones, you know, <laughs> don't give me the, the junk ones. Okay. Um, and really that's it. It was weird. It was a weird month. I had some, I'll kind of at the very end tack it on, but I had some physical pain. Um, my sciatica was bothering me. My parents visited and my mother is a yoga instructor among other things. And she actually showed me some mobility things that can really help stretch my sciat my, um, my body out so that my sciatica doesn't flare up. So thankfully my sciatica has been not giving me pain. Um, I'm also just learning not to sit all wonky to exaggerate it. Um, I think I had a cold at the very, very beginning of the month, which was not great because, you know, colds can really wear one down. Um, my computer bro broke. The end of that story was that I had to buy, buy a new computer. That was sort of its own saga. I still haven't gotten my computer back from the people who were trying to fix my computer. That's a whole nother saga. Um, as I mentioned, my parents visited and we were just up, down, and all around town. <laughs> we went to the beach. Um, I took some time off of work. 
We had Hurricane Helene um, blow through, not my specific area, but other areas a few hours away were devastated. We got, my town got quite a bit of wind, but thankfully, very thankfully, there was no extensive damage to my specific area. But I know that a lot of people, um, especially in my state, South Carolina, and in my neighboring state, North Carolina, have been suffering without power and um, just extensive damage and uh, deaths. And so I'm, you know, I've been praying for them and I've been so grateful that I have not, um, that my area and the people I know have been safe, you know? Um, and yeah, I just, it's just been like wild times over here. Um, every month is always a surprise. And the surprise for this one was that I was given a lot of curveballs. Um, but so much to be grateful for, you know, like I could just, I could cry right now for the gratitude that I have for the life that I have been given. So um, anyways, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you all in my next one.